like to call to order the meeting of the Sunderland School Committee um, as far as the Select Board and <laughs> Finance Committee. Do you guys have a quorum? Do you need to call those to order too? Select Board goes, Finance Committee is back. Okay. Tom Coley, who's the chair? I believe so. I've not heard the details. Here we go. 602, I count the order select. Outstanding. All right. Um, let's see. <clears throat> We're going to mix up the order a little bit. We have Bill here to talk to us about the uh, oil tank options, I, I believe. Yep. Uh, so we're going to move that to the front. Has everybody got to read the report from Tyne Bond? I think I shared it a while back. Okay. So the report <clears throat> came back, and it's really what I thought it was going to be, where they're, <clears throat> they're recommending to do the um, fiberglass tank underground. The only issue with that, or maybe it might be a good thing, is it's 60 weeks out right now, tanks are. So that's 14 months, so it's over a year. Um, so that gives us time. To figure things out from there there were a couple things under the tank and permitting stuff where they reference the Sunderland's fire department and i believe that's the chief that has to um, give out the permit for this this <coughs> job and so um, i'm not quite positive when a good time to bring him in would be maybe it's now i don't know if anybody has any what's the 60 saying? weeks clock ticking okay What's that? What starts the 60 weeks clock? Oh, like well, it's come up with money or yeah, we, we would have to get it funded and then it would have to go out the bid. Yeah. And then once a contractor won the bid, they would order the tank. So, and then 60 weeks from, from there, from there. Yeah. That's just what they're saying now. Mm -hmm. Um, that could get better. That could get worse. That could stay the same. Um, we're still waiting on a generator for a school that's over a year now. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things we talked about last meeting, which you weren't here for, was, you know, Peter was kind of filling us in on the town's timeline, ARPA funds, those kind of things. And we said, oh, we have time to wait. And Darius and I said, wait, if it's going to take that long to get the product in, right. we really don't have that time to wait because the longer we wait, the longer it takes to get there. You're adding a year on to whenever <laughs> yeah. you pull the trigger. Correct. Yep. Oh. <clears throat> That's why we're all meeting here together. Welcome, Select Board. Um, so I guess the question is, I guess I have two questions. What is you think the timeline on, is on approving the ARPA funds? And then two, is this going to be a town project or a school project? Meaning that sometimes, in, as I'm working with other towns and other communities, sometimes the town takes it on, they put out the bid and they oversee the project. Um, being outside of the actual building walls, sometimes it, you know, Example, kind of put a playground in the town over saw the project. You know, right now we're doing a, a project outside of Deerfield Elementary, the front walkway. The town's taking that project where we're doing the floors inside the building. So it's just who is the person overseeing it. Once the funds are secured, if that's about the bid, if we are taking care of it, we're going to work through FERCOG because the kind of bidding we don't have in-house resources to do. Um, and then moving that process forward, selecting the school committee would then be in charge of selecting the bid and so on and so forth or the town takes it and this is something you guys can discuss and whatever but that's one of those things we we'll have to figure out is who's overseeing the project um, and i think when we did the playground here it was a combo jeff um worked really closely with ben and i on the playground bid here with did did that yeah. out as well yeah, yeah. so um, that might be the route that you guys want to go as well that it's but so again a decision you know when and if we secure funds or when we secure funds we go positive um that kind of decision about how you want to do that peter i mean there's got to be one governing body of it though i, I imagine someone has to unless you do joint meetings to approve the bid you know that kind of thing you're gonna to have to have one governing body be yeah. the one i mean you're working together and that kind of stuff but somebody's got to be the one who's on the i, I imagine legally on the hook for it well, I, 
this is slightly different, but we have a cost estimate in the time and bond report. <clears throat> do we work with those numbers for terms of what we want to appropriate, or do we say, well, that really wasn't somebody? I mean, that, is that a, is that are those numbers valid for moving forward? Yeah. Yeah, and so basically we have to come up with an envelope number to then go out to bid. And they're going to come in a little bit conservative because they don't want you to go out to bid and then all of a sudden be sticker shocked that it's, you know, $100,000 more. I'm, to, I'm throwing big numbers not to, you know, talk about the project itself. But, um, you know, that's how we do, that's how we've done all the other bigger projects that we're working on now in the district is that you have to have to come up with a base number that, again, is usually conservative. Um, and then it goes out to bid and then we go for a little bid off that. And so, there's probably going to be some additional costs in there for creating bid specs. We, while we have the tie and bond report, we have to get full specs done for the bid process. I'm not sure if this requires engineering, but I imagine it does. So there might be some additional fees and timeline that we have to consider as well. <clears throat> then the question would be, do you need engineering done before you go to the tank, Bill? I, th I, I really think that that's built into these contingencies in here. I, I, I do. Say again. But I would have to. I think it might be built into the contingencies in this pricing. But I, I would have to ask them that to do the design work and the engineering. Yeah, if yeah. that's included, you know. Yeah. I know they they said they would come and speak at one of these meetings. That that's included. I know that. But it's also. I mean, it's both a question of funds, but it's also a question of what sort of steps in the process we got to go through before we put it out to bid. And do we have, it's one thing to say, well, you got the money in the thing for the engineering, but if you have to actually get some engineering done, you know, that's got to be fit into the timeline. And I'm assuming I don't know anything about it. But right. it seems yeah, that has to be done before we can even put it out to bid. Right. Those pieces have to be. I mean, I'm just looking at the stuff that complete. is sitting out there that's got to happen before you know, we can talk about going out to bid and then we're looking at 60 weeks or something like that. And, you know, if you think about wanting to get it in, not this summer, but next summer, you know, the, the, the wiggle room is narrowing. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, I particular, I don't have any particular cares to, you know, who, who, who takes overall leadership in terms of running this project. I mean, I would be quite happy as a member of the school committee, but let the select board then get to it. You guys have more experience in this stuff than a lot of what we do. I was going to the other <laughs> So the way that we've worked it in a couple of the different projects is the select board of the town has signed the contract, accepted and signed the contract with the um, winning bidder because it's town funding. It's not school committee money that we're spending. But then working in collaboration with myself, the principal, whoever the architect is to make sure that all of those everything's taken care of that's supposed to be taken care of <clears throat> so that's why i think it could end up being um a joint effort which worked well for the playground yeah you know yeah, we all the way the playground works would sort of uh, i or the select board would sign anything that you know, change orders whatever and after it had been approved by the school did all the actual decision making and then all the finance stuff just came through our office too and i got the you know prevailing wage report like that so happy to split do that splitting. yeah because some of it's going to fall on their audit like jeff just mentioned the prevailing wage if they ever get audited on that piece they've got to have the documentation not us so it is going to be a little bit of a deal and we're seeing with some of the other large projects that we're doing you know the spec timeline and engineering process is what four to six weeks at a minimum. Mm -hmm. And then bidding is another four-ish weeks from there. And then once you grant your contract, your timeline starts for the product. And I think we're okay with the pricing because it's, you know, once it's ordered, the price isn't gonna change unless there's change orders involved in the project. And, you know, we're not talking about bidding it six to eight months from now, I think. We're talking about mm -hmm. bidding it in this in the fall possibly if we can move that quickly <clears throat> we don't fit it till the fall and it's still 60 weeks it's a hard time putting it in next summer 
Yeah, I mean, but we're talking it's mid February. Right. I don't know how quickly the town's going to secure the funding, but say we've got an eight week timeline between specs, engineering, and bidding. We're looking at March, April. Maybe we can get it out to bid in May or June. Maybe. <clears throat> I mean, it strikes me. It's you got to be sort of open to try and do something like that. Otherwise, it's just like, okay, we go now we're looking at two and a half years. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Once groundbreaking occurs, do we know how long the install process would be? I don't. Right, because it would be a big disruption if it obviously... That's all going to depend on years. also if there's any contaminated soil. That's going to make right. a big difference. Well, a piece of machinery out there, recess would be so easy to supervise. All the kids <laughs> just be sitting at the fence watching it dig up the ground. Good point. Preschool, easy for recess. You wouldn't even use that <laughs> playground again. I mean, so if that is the case, I do wonder if we push to have it at the bid, if the funding is secured by the end of the school year, just so that 60 weeks brings us into the summer of the 24th. We have to move pretty quickly to make that happen. If it's full, 60 weeks for now. Right. You were talking the end of the school year, 60 weeks puts us at the end next summer, right. starting the project, yeah. unless they can have a turnaround. Yeah. Two yeah. weeks. Right. Yeah. 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 You got any idea how long the process would take once they? The actual construction process? No, that's what Ben just asked, and I'm not positive how long that would take. I don't think it's going to be super long. But I have that question written down to ask them tomorrow. Okay. And I, mean, I just sort of want to feel like we walk out of here tonight. We've got a <coughs> plan forward that is moving, get you know, moving. So right. I, I think we could start some of the first steps. We can get in touch with FERCOG and see what their availability is. We can get a quote on what the cost is to contract with them, which is probably less than a thousand dollars. Um, we can have Bill reach out to Ty and Bond to answer some of these questions and find out what the cost is to do specs and if we need additional engineering of any sort, because they should know that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and at least get that process started, get an estimated timeline for how long that will take, you know, and then maybe that gives the town a couple of weeks to determine the funding if this is something that and it's the it's it's Ty and Bond the one that would, would do the engineering or would that be some other party? Uh we could contract with them. If it's under thirty thousand dollars, we don't have to put it up to bid for engineering. So we got no we ought to have no additional procurement hassle as far as dealing with the engineering part. No. Just more money. Just what? Just more money. Yeah, <laughs> you know, stuff's got to be done, it's got to be done. At least we know. <laughs> I just want to see this thing, you know, feel like the same thing is moving rather than. I hear you. Okay. But I'm going to have to go back to the town and say, when do you think the timeline of the money? So we, we, guys we, thinking about, we, I mean, my sense is that there's been support on your board, so you can offer money for this. But so let's say August 1st is with our, our absolute last, like, get the project started. That gives some time before kids come back, a little bit of leeway in there. That would mean that June 1st of this year would be our need to order the tank in order to get it here for August 1st of the following year. And so if you're saying it's going to be eight weeks for the engineering and the, all that stuff, that brings us back to April 1st. So we would need to be able to commit secure funding by April 1st. That's more time than I thought we had. So that, that, thought, that thought is, I, I was thinking it was going to be like March 1st, um, but that does months to figure this out um there was definitely uh discussion on the board about using arpa funds for that i think it's sort of a, a very viable option for that um, and as peter knows we're, we're on the capital planning committee trying to figure out how to fund a whole bunch of things this being one of the bigger ones but not the only thing there's <laughs> a million dollars worth of capital expenses we're trying to fund. um but given the timeline on this like refinishing the floors in the Pushed off by a couple of months. We we're not talking about having in the back of the school picking up the ground. So I would, I would be certainly on board with making this a, a an ARPA request for you to have the money secured back. 
there isn't really anything else on our docket where if we don't order it now, we're waiting an extra year for either school or whatever. Obviously, we'll have to discuss that in the, the board. What is the spending deadline for ARPA funds? They commit by the end of 24. Right. Okay. And then spend, I think it's 18 months after that. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So we have some time still on that. Um, that being said, people in Washington are talking about those emergency funds and the emergency's over. So if you haven't spent it, what are you doing? We're going to take it back. So um, there's talk. Certainly, at least save around. It makes it makes sense to if we're going to spend the money, spend it sooner rather than later. So, yeah, and I'm, I'm also like, you know, the one of the duties of the ARPA thing is to, <clears throat> when you decide to do something, it just takes your board to approve it, and it's a can be a quick process. And in this case, if you know, based on your timeline, it's like, well, we don't, we wouldn't need to approve it till the first of April, but like. You know, it seems to me like in this thing, the more things you can keep getting done, you know, they're not right up against the deadline, the sort of smarter you're being because it's like keep moving the thing forward. And this is also taking 60 weeks as, a, as an actual delivery time as Who opposed knows? to the yeah. best guess we have right now. <laughs> because yeah. it's a very yeah. solid chance that 60 weeks turns into 65 or 70 weeks right. in the end. So, uh, you know, I've said it's one until it's going to be more extreme. Yeah. Right. So can we put that on the agenda for next meeting there to discuss using ARPA funds for that yeah. for three okay. reasons? So then whatever you got on your <laughs> plate for moving forward needs to yep. get into gear. Yep. Right. Okay. You move kind of quickly. Tennis courts are already out to bid. Awesome. Um, yeah. Frontier just approved that. Look. Four weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, what happens if the oil tank fails between now and two years from now? We have, a, meet, we have, a, joint, we have a joint meeting to discuss what we're going to do. <laughs> I, mean, I, I guess my point is that's still an issue, right? It's still, we're not, we're solving an issue two years down the line, but we still have vulnerability with the net. There's, oh. there's non zero risk. <laughs> we're better equipped to know if we are. Because you guys uh, were able to put the uh, the, 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 monitor, the, yep. the monitor on that makes you know lets us know if there's a change in pressure due to leak. We'll know when a leak happens, rather when it's happening instead of six months later when we have an environmental issue. So, Bill, I saw you underlining and uh, going over the document. Anything else? Going um. On? There were some things in here about the, and I think I said it, but the there's no money put aside in this project so far for contaminated soil. I don't know. I guess, I don't know. You could make your contingency higher. I don't, you know what I mean? I don't know how else you would do that. Um, and then it says something in here about local and state permitting, but I think I think I need to reach <laughs> out to the fire chief maybe and have a conversation here in Sunderland. Shelly, you had asked about engineering as well, because there's also a line in there about uh, someone obtained site survey plans prior to conducting any engineering design or commencing construction activities. So does that fall on them or us? Um, I, it'll probably part of, be part of the spec building process. <clears throat> yeah. I can ask that question too. Because we had to have all that done before the track went out to bid, before the tennis courts went out to bid, they came out and did all that work. That's that would be part of typically part of the fee we're paying for the specs to be designed. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Awesome like work. You guys got any more questions for Bill here before we move on, probably? Oh, he answered most of our questions about this when, when he met with us the last time. <coughs> we have anything we'll reach out. Yeah, I mean, just keep good communication on this because, I mean, that was the key is that we have to talk with good communication. But thanks, Bill. Yeah, you're welcome. Oh. 
You're leaving? I thought I we were going to do the budget presentation. Oh, Didn't that's we right. We did talk about, about that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. my, my throat is giving up yeah. on me tonight. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> I think um, I'll let you and Darius handle this. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, so. All right. So the budget <laughs> is next on the agenda, but uh, I want to make a quick announcement. Uh, coming up, neither Keith nor I are planning on seeking re-election. So uh, there will be two seats available on school committee. And if anyone's interested, uh, the town caucus, uh, it was March 6th. Six. Yep. <clears throat> so you show up and people will nominate you uh, if necessary, bring people if, if you like. And uh, it's fairly easy to sign up if you're interested in, uh, in a seat on school committee, which has been a real privilege and something that I've enjoyed a lot. Oh, it's been it's been a privilege and I've learned a lot too. Indeed. How many years have you guys been on? Nine. <laughs> I think so, yeah, yeah. Knowledge. You guys came out of you? Third term? I think so. Mm -hmm. Curious. I can see some in Queen, but <laughs> we'll celebrate you folks later. You both we weren't there when we started. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's just something that it's just been rolling around my head. It's more from the frontier. Um, with the um, boilers going in, there was like a, a letter about thinking forward about how we're going to be heating and looking for more green options. Like, so this is something that as this building ages and like going forward, so this is going to be a replacement that's not necessarily like a really green option, It'd probably be more efficient, be better. But so like now is the time to start thinking about like long term about like critical needs within the town and then how can that be changed going forward and it's going to have it can't just be because i feel like on frontier it's, <clears throat> the decision was made and now there's voices saying oh you should think about this it, it's not going to be just the school committee that is going to be able to think about the green options nor looks like there's going to have to be like all town agencies working together to think about how to move forward on critical um town buildings so this is the long-term plug. Thank you. All right. Fiscal year 24 budget. Okay, let's get into it again. Um, Megan, there is a paper copy here. If you don't, if you want one, I'll take them back. And oh yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Here that. I was gonna say. Oh, sorry, Jeff. Yeah, I did on. send this to you, Jeff, electronically. Did you share it? Okay. Um, so much of the narrative looks exactly like school committee had already seen last month because the way that we left that meeting was that we wanted to talk with select board about what the starting point of the budget was because there are some important pieces included in here that are contributing to our significant increase. Um, so I'm not going to do as lengthy of a presentation, but I thought since we have guests and I know we have quite a few people um, watching us, so I thought I'd go over a couple of the points here um, and then we can talk about um, next steps from there. So uh, the first draft of the budget was presented at a 6.63% increase, uh, roughly 210,000 over the prior year. Uh, this is a significant number uh, because outside of one position that was a new initiative this year, the rest of the increase is level funding. So existing staffing was replicated, existing services was replicated, um, with the exception of some increase for facilities needs. Uh, so the starting point uh, is always to <coughs> uh, consider what our contractual and non-contractual wage adjustments are. Um, and factor in what our salary obligations are to begin with. So for FY24, we're looking at an increase of $124,000 just in wages, which is almost 4%. It's right around a 4% increase as the first starting point of our budget. That is due to teacher and IA contract negotiations, as well as uh, COLA built in for school-based staff and central office staff. Um, the COLA and the teacher and the IA contract are both at 2% this year, but anyone that is stepping will receive an additional 3.19. So if you're stepping, you're getting 5.19%. Uh, 
Um, if there's any column movement, someone advances their degree, that increases that amount. Um, so the teacher and the IA portion on the budget increase is pretty significant. Um, and it's hard to start a budget with a 4% increase before you've done any other work on it. But this is the reality of where Sunderland is at this year. Okay. Oh, you have a thing. Perfect. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so after we look at the wage increases, I then go back and look at a three-year history of actual expenditures from all of our non-salary accounts, and then also take into consideration needs from um, directors of other departments. So uh, facilities, IT, special education, obviously Ben has input as well. Uh, and we are showing a $34,000 increase to non-salary expenditures. That is, again, not for any new initiatives. That is just to right side our budget. So our accounts have been over the last several years, particularly facilities related. So um, custodial wages for overtime and summer help, uh, we've gone over in that line. Our trash account has been over. They keep increasing trash rates. We all know inflation for supplies and materials. Um, I don't have to tell anyone in this room how badly we need an increase in our general repair line. So that was about 14,000. We had another 10,000 increase in building heat. Several years we have been over budget on those. Um, and then some other minor changes in, uh, in account lines. And while I'm saying we're right-siding the budget, uh, there might be the question of how have we paid for this in the past if we've been over for several years. Uh, sometimes we can take from other line items, for example, if we don't fully fund the substitute line because we didn't need as many substitutes or Ben was creative with his staffing, uh, we can move money around to cover those overages. But we're at a point after multiple years of being in deficit in those lines where we really should consider at a minimum for the facilities needs increasing those lines so that we can really take care of our building. <clears throat> uh, after that, we look at uh, special education drivers. So we look at uh, out of district placements for students who were placing in another school because we can't meet their needs. We also look at specialized transportation, and that is for students who are coming to Sunderland, but also students who are going out of district. We're actually seeing a decrease in specialized transportation because of some changing in some routes. So we've taken that $10,000 uh, decrease out of the budget. There is some risk in this because next year, who knows what's gonna happen for transportation needs. So if we were in a, in a budget year that we're much healthier and we weren't starting off with four and 5% increase just for those minor things I already mentioned, I probably wouldn't change this number because it's something that fluctuates and we really should keep it in as a buffer. But given we need to save some money somewhere, it felt fiscally responsible to pull that money out at this point um, and save that $10,000. So from there, we look at revolving funds. Uh, we look at revolving funds and grant revenue. So school choice, early childhood revolving. Um, if we had a special education revolving fund, if we were bringing in a tuition and student, we would look at those expenses. Grants include um, IDEA, Title I, <coughs> excuse me, circuit breaker. We make sure that the expenses we paid from prior years can be funded in the next fiscal year. We're gonna talk particularly about school choice because I think that's on everybody's mind since our last meeting and it is something that the town has worked with us on to make sure that we could build, build up good uh, choice reserves. But technically in this budget, there's no negative impact from grant or revolving funds. Last step of our process is to look at new initiatives. Um, and I know Ben sent out a document to school committee today talking about this position and it's something that you all wanted to consider as part of our ask and dive into a little bit deeper. So I will defer to him for that piece, but to talk about the financials, um, we did ask for the addition of one new uh, position that would fall to the teacher contract for a school adjustment counselor to provide increased mental health support for students, um, as well as support for families and staff. That is roughly a $60,000 increase, which is almost 2%. So if you're doing the math, following along, started at four, went up to five, um, now, you know, we're, we're over six. So 6.63 um, is the draft with all of those pieces taken into consideration. I know I just talked really quickly because we did go over this in, in much more detail last month. Um, so I'll pause there to see if there's any questions before we keep going or if I missed anything. Okay. 
You're preaching my song. That's what I say all the time. It's not just benefits. I mean, it's not just wages. It's tough when you add wages in because you're talking what? Another 10, 15,000 potentially? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> um, I gave you some charts in here to look at this time because I feel like I've given you so much data points and other presentations that it kind of gets lost. But the points that I wanted to make here, it's that it's really clear to see um, when you're looking at all expenditures, the majority of the budget, the total budget, the majority of it is going directly to educating our students. So that education and leadership, that is anyone who falls under a teaching position, IAs, um, principal, the other school staff, that's about 80% of our budget there. And then when you look at the wages, uh, you can see that about 80% is just educational staff, so directly teaching students. Um, enrollment is uh, something that we touched on briefly at the last meeting, but I do think we should talk about it as part of this narrative so we can see the whole picture. Uh, it's really clear here that our numbers have gone down um, some of that natural from pandemic, we knew why families were making other choices at those times. Uh, we would expect this number to be starting to go back up at this point. However, we're not seeing the data that shows that. Um, so our school is significantly smaller than it was pre-pandemic. Um, what does that mean as far as budget impact? Well, now we're talking about um, it's really great that our classes are very small and that our students are getting a lot of individual and one-to-one -one attention that they need and deserve. And when we're talking about a 6% budget, if we're not talking about enrollment and staffing, we're not doing justice to the process um, and really should be talking about what class sizes look like, what's the impact, do we have anyone retiring, which we know um, we don't this year in Sunderland, but those are the kind of conversations we don't talk about regularly, but this feels like it's an important part of our story this year. Again, we can come back to this and, and do you have a question now? I think Jeff had a question. Okay. Um, just a clarification because you've been talking about insurance as well and the general fund expenditure by category. Yeah. Uh, 1.3% spent on benefits and insurance. That's for the shared position. That's for right. central office. I just want to make sure that we all understand. Yep. Great question. Yes, that does not cover expenses that the town pays for school employees. <laughs> I got a question about the, the uh, enrollment data. Yep. The 147 that you have for the duplicated, is that just residents or is that include school choice? Um, it's our uh, residents. Residents, okay. Yeah. And we're expecting somewhere in the vicinity of 40 ish school choice? Something yeah. Like that. So similar numbers to the 2022. Is that true? No, that has to be. No, that's that, I think they have a typo there. Does not, does not include pre-K. 147 one, includes school choice, but does not include pre-K. It does include school choice. And pre-K, right. you have two sections, total of 30 slots. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay. And currently 12 that are signed up or are just getting this done. Um, is that a normal position to be in this time of year to have that many slots open, or is that more slots open than you would focus? It's a great question. Yeah, and at this time of year, there's it's we usually have more more signups. We have anticipated enrollment. Um, we have twelve known enrollment uh, pre kers for next year. Um, four identified, four additional students identified through early intervention that will be joining us at some point through the year. Um, that would bring us up to 16, and eight of those 16 students would uh, be on IEPs, so just about half, um, or yeah, half. And um, two, two of the 16 English learner students as well. And what happens if we end up with only 16 students? Do we end up doing one section? Do we end up still doing two sections of each of them? So, um, you know, numbers only tell part of the story. 
-hmm. right? And some of it is based on need. Of those 16 students, not all would necessarily be coming full day every day. And so that's something that we would have to figure out with the families um, and our director of early childhood education. But that is definitely part of the conversation right now that that we're having is how do we handle pre-K if we don't hit that 18 open spot? You know, if we don't get 18 more applications. So as of so in addition to those um, current four early intervention projected referrals, we as of January 26, we've received an additional five uh, community applications. So that would bring the total, if everyone ended up coming, that would bring the total up to 21. So while we're talking about preschool um, and enrollment numbers, let's talk a little bit about the revolving fund because that is another piece of the puzzle here. Um, that data is on page seven there. So I don't know if you want to scroll down to that. Um, so we've been fortunate even though we did suffer a little bit during the pandemic with um, families not enrolling in early childhood, um, we were able to supplement salaries and wages, as you remember, with some ESSER funding. So we didn't have to cut any staff. Um, we were able to maintain programming. So we've been fortunate to build up that revolving fund so that we have about a $75,000 cushion and starting of the year balance. Um, the numbers currently are based on full classrooms. So while Nathaniel's asking these pointed questions, if we don't fill them, we're not going to have the revenue that we need to cover the expenditures that are planned. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> that $75,000 that we have as reserves could quickly get eaten up if we did maintain two sections without being full for a moment. Um, so again, a bit of a risk here. Uh, with this fund and it's too early for us to make decisions. We don't have, you know, the community's not fully prepared to be applying. People aren't making those decisions necessarily at this point. Um, and we may not be ready to make that decision before the budget has to be ready to go to town meeting. So um, this is one of the challenges. And I said in that beginning narrative, there's no impact currently from revolving funds, but this could be uh, something that we have to continue conversations about and could have future budget impact for us moving forward. Would you say to say that either we get more involvement, we do two sections, and the budget reductions are fairly accurate, or we don't get much involvement, we have to do one section, and then the, the savings of the additional staff to the second section offset the reduced income from the choice of um, in an ideal world, yes, that would be how it works, but it's never that simple. Um, you know, as Ben has said, that it's not just the numbers. They don't tell the whole story. So needs of the student, um, how much, you know, uh, special education services we have to provide. Um, but those are the conversations that we're having as a school committee and particularly in our, you know, principal superintendent business manager meetings. And they're hard decisions, and um, none are being made lightly. And I do want to add that we've been very active in getting the word out about <laughs> regarding the opening openings in preschool. Um, we've sent an advertisement to two newspapers. We've uh, posted in a couple different Facebook group, groups, um, set up some advertisements around town, including the town library. There is a weekly play group that meets here in Sunderland. Um, least we put the word out there. And that same playground uh, play group um, is in a couple other spots as well, the town library and the space in Deerfield. So we've really been trying to get the word out about that. Can I ask clarify the numbers again? Because I'm looking at 12 known anticipated leaving 18 spots for two <coughs> classrooms, five applications received. So that's 17, but then you're saying there's four more that have been identified are those applications that so, goes us to 21. So we're looking at nine spots. We have a total of um, eight returning students, four of which are on IEPs. We have four additional early intervention referrals to bring us up to a total of 12. Um, then we've had an additional five applications to bring us to seven. Um, 17. 
Or did I, did I miss up the mess up the numbers there? Yeah, seventeen. Yeah, I think the confusion yeah. was with the for, for early intervention. Okay. Yeah. They're part of the twelve already. Oh, so those twelve eight would be on IEPs. So we're then so further down, it's just anticipated yeah. that there will be eighteen openings. So we're looking at thirteen now. Yeah, I was just making the point that there's five applications. We haven't accepted those students. Okay. And they know. may have applied to multiple places. So right. You can't guarantee that they're coming. Exactly. So we'll there's technically sure, 18. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. And then there are 18, two, 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 two sections, 15, two sections, the 30 total. What's the typical ratio of um, IV, IV students? Um, around half. It is always yeah. around half. Yeah. So this is nothing kind of happening. Yeah. And, and it's, I mean, it, it, ch it changes from one year to the next. Right. But it's yeah. typically half yeah. is what you would expect. So. Yeah. It's not out of the ordinary, the numbers you're seeing are correct. Okay. Yeah. And then historically, aren't there always, isn't there always like a little bump in the summer with families moving in that we have to plan that there's? Yeah, we, we've seen that in both pre K and K for sure. Right. But just because it may not be on the top of mind, it's, it's like when there's the um, preschool students who are on IEPs don't pay tuition. And so, as that, it's, it's always around half, but our total number is less, but it's still half. Our revenues are down, so it's I'm just kind of you know. Okay. What's what's an ideal class size? I mean, I I know an ideal class size from our teacher perspective might be different from a fiscal perspective, but but and I've seen you know for second grade for example, we have 19 year old who use two classes, 10 students at one and nine and others that that's feeling like a, a, a nice but very small class size. Right, and so with those numbers, so it all depends. Okay, so it depends on the makeup of the class, the number of students and IEPs and the height and demands of those students, and also grade level. As you get two students get older, you can have, um, from an administrative perspective, you get more students in a class, given, you know, what are the demands of that class in the sense of other, you know, other high behavioral needs and that, you know, you know other IEP needs where um, you need more adult supervision or um, help in the classroom. So that depends, but um, 19, you know, some of these numbers have, I just want people to also know that the numbers have trickled. Like we didn't start at 19. So during the pandemic, we didn't really know what our numbers are. Coming out of the pandemic, we had larger numbers. And now um, you know, people are either leaving the district for multiple reasons, either moving out of the district, doing other options. Um, and we're seeing it across the board, not just in one class, but we're losing a few in each class. So these healthy numbers are now turning into, like I say, two classes for 19 is below what we would want to see ideally. We'd like to see probably in a second grade classroom, you know, 14 to 16, I would say, um, depending on the needs. Again, if these are generous general needs, um, you know, um, I mean, obviously they're the IEP students, but, you know, you know, we can handle with a, a two person group there. Um, and then as you get into the upper grades, um, you're looking at, you know, between, again, these are kind of just pushing general numbers out there, but, you know, between 16 and 20 um, in those upper grades, you can go even higher. Um, if, the, if the needs of the classroom are being met. Um, and that's what we've seen, you know, whatever. You go to an inner city school or with, you know, five you can have 30 in a classroom, you know. So it's, you know, it's depending on where you are, what the, um, what the range is in your area of what you're servicing. That's what other area elementary schools look like around us. <clears throat> I'm just looking at the enrollment numbers and even with like the even if we end up getting a bunch more students and we end up hitting 25, something like that, we're still looking at a substantial decrease in enrollment from last year. 180 total last year, or 2022 is the last year in team here. And even with 15 students, um, we're still looking at only being at 162. So, you know, that's a whole factor right there that we lost student wise, um, which means that our per student. Dollars mm -hmm. now is going up dramatically. Um, and I certainly don't want to make huge class sizes, but also, you know, if we're talking about a 6.6% increase, and, and, and just, just for context, the, the amount that we're asking for is pretty much the entire two and a half percent of the amount that it's for, which is going to be real hard because. That's what everyone else is asking for. A lot more money. <laughs> yeah, but the fire department came to us and said anything that we're fired and doubled in and doubled the cost of the last year. Um, because everyone's you know jacking prices up all over the place. Um so 
guess the question would be, can we get away with making a single set third class? Can we do three third fourth classes? Something like that. Is there a way for us to be able to move these numbers around a little bit and find them on for the extra position without that being increased at school? Um, mm -hmm. I love the idea of having the position, especially in the pandemic time when kids are having the roughest time they will probably ever have in the next 20 years, hopefully. Um, but again, you know, at this point, we're we're, we're staring down a lot of dirty, nasty budgets on all of this and um, So just like to get that out there, it, is there a way for us to, to do some, some interesting things with fat sizes and whatnot? Um, I mean, 19 seems like a lot, but I also have 32 in my class. So it's fun, but it's very elementary senior year senior class, uh, sixth grade. So um, it's not 29. Those are the hard questions we're trying to come up with answers to right now. Right, can we make reductions to make budget smaller? That's always an op that's an option within the budget. And yeah. then I think what this the reason one of the reasons here for the of many of the conversations is understanding where the town's finances are, understanding where where we are and what we're asking for, and you sharing <laughs> with the two and a half override is is a number we need to know. Um, and I think that's part of the data gathering we're getting as to where where that number has to come, you know, where it has to, you know, where the the recommendation from the well, the budget that the school committee puts forward, um, you know, does it work within what the town's going to be looking for? Is it going to be at odds with the town? You know, because you know, they can come up with whatever budget number they want, um, but you know, that goes, to, you know, as you understand, it goes to the town that kind of thing. But if it doesn't work well, it's going to be that position we want to put ourselves in. Or, or the town, for that matter. So that's part of this conversation. So I you put out a number. Have you got a number for frontier broken by the town yet? Oh. Or do you figure on having that? When the governor releases her budget, March seventh. So another month. <laughs> and I'm yeah. assuming that something similar is going on with the school as far as how it might be divided. <coughs> same sort of yeah. Same sort yeah. of calendar. Tech school has gone up 100 students in the last five years. So I imagine that you're, I don't know how many I can go through, how many are sending I think there's another applicant this year. I think there's um, three more in last year. Three more in the last year. All right. So that number is going to go up as well. It goes up, you know, it's all got to come out of the same. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I appreciate the conversation. I appreciate the understand. I, I want to uh, flesh out the position a little bit more uh, because it seems <laughs> like the kind of thing would be really easy to just eliminate that additional position. Uh, but and if we end up there, we end up there. But uh, it's important enough to understand what the needs are that uh, we can do. I don't know, Ben, if you want to say a few words. Yeah, and so I, I had outlined a lot of the the talking points on this at, at our last meeting. Um, and I, I guess the only thing I would add to that is, um, you know, when, when meeting with my uh, in-house instructional leadership team, and, um, you know, we, we look at anything and everything, right, to um, school events, uh, school culture, um, academics, so on and so forth. And we held a lot of discussion about uh, social emotional wellness and health of our students. And we started, we did an exercise around the multi tiered system of supports, which touches on academic, behavioral, and social emotional support of, of students. And we identified the um, current resources we had in place. And then also looked at where we were um, <clears throat> needed additional support. And that's kind of where the school adjustment counselor position came in. Um, this position would, um, and actually to back up another step, is um, we would have an opportunity with this position to bring in a, a screener um, that would be um, administered in 
all classrooms across all grade levels and uh, identify students' needs in eight different competency areas. And the school adjustment counselor would oversee this. They would help to provide tier one instruction, tier one instruction um, alongside classroom teachers. They would also additionally um, be pulling kids um, in tier two who need a higher level of support and intervention that wouldn't be taking place um, or in addition to what is taking place in, in the classrooms. Um, they would be working closely with classroom teachers, our special education team, partnering with families. Um, and as uh, Nathaniel just, just mentioned that um, coming out of the pandemic in the social emotional needs of the students, <clears throat> You know that's it's really a a uh, priority and something that we've identified. Um, and I, I but I think like in regards to that position or any other staffing positions, like the this the school the school committee really needs a a solid idea as to what number we should be coming in at, right? Because that 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 changes the conversation. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so any questions <laughs> in particular about that position? Would it be fair to say that it wouldn't um, this this position wouldn't only be supporting students, but it would be um, reducing some of the pressures on the other staff? I, I've been looking at our you know trends of staff attrition over the last two years. Mm -hmm. and if this would also help us make our staff feel supported, that would be significant yeah, as well. Yeah, I, I, I'd say so. Um, and, you know, the, the pandemic was interesting. And prior to prior to the pandemic, the only faculty turnover we had was with retirements and or moving out of the state. Um, and, and since then, um, we've seen more turnover. Mm -hmm. We have an incredibly hardworking, talented, um, and dedicated team right now. and. Um, they are they're moving mountains in terms of um, keeping our school school culture strong, supporting our students with 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 love and empathy. And this would just be another way to um, provide the students with a um, a really solid experience here at the school, especially for those who need it most. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I'm a soapbox really quick. Uh, maybe, and correct me if I'm if I'm wrong here. You know, it seems like in the old days, the uh, special education model was, well, you know, there are some students who are special and some students that are typical and, and never the twain shall meet. And uh, it, currently there's this understanding that uh, there's a whole range of maybe an academic issue that goes on treated eventually becomes a behavioral like attention issue so that uh, i always think of the education uh, as an investment not an expense right and this is a way of getting more for your investment <clears throat> by addressing small issues while they're still small having someone who's looking around able to screen and detect things uh, while they're still formative and, and bring that experience to bear uh, and support the teachers uh, and so provide services up and down uh, I think probably would have benefited all three of my girls who went through the school to have this position filled um, so like to echo uh, the thing with comments I'm interested in creative ways we can uh, still support this position understanding that it may or may not be possible to piggyback on that, claiming that education is an investment, it's particularly true at the preschool level when we talk about, you know, what if we had just one <laughs> giant preschool? Um, those kids who are going to be in preschool next year have spent much of their early lives in isolation because of the pandemic there in general behind where they typically would be. So having an overcrowded preschool classroom um, would be the opposite of an investment in those kids. They, they are the ones most at need of a really strong program with lots of personal attention. Right. And, and that carries on to students in the early grades now in, in, totally. in the formative years in K1 and 2, where um, 
they they just missed out on on, on so much. And for for some of our kindergarteners, preschoolers coming in, their first experience in um, being around other students consistently their age was the first day of school for them. I mean, in an ideal world, we've got lots of money to work with. In an ideal world, we'd be able to raise taxes more than two and a half percent without having to get everyone in town to do it. <laughs> in an ideal world, the state government would have been all the knowledge that this is a, a real great <laughs> on, on towns and that the pandemic was hard and they would have passed something this last year that would give more money to the towns and kind of stuff rather than getting a refund to everybody. Um, and then they, you know, I would love to find a way to support the, the school position. position. Um, we just have to figure out how to make that work. Related to state funding, um, since our last meeting, I've spoken with both uh, Joe Comerford and Natalie Blay about the um, the rural aid line. There was a, anybody who doesn't know, there was a rural schools commission um, last year and they released their findings. And one of them was uh, a recommendation of increasing the rural aid. Um, I think it's from 6 million to 61 million. Um, and so we're waiting on the governor's budget to see if she's going to fund that recommendation. That could have a meaningful impact here, right, Shelley? Oh, yeah. If that was fully funded. Yeah. I think they said the average was 85,000 per school. Is that what it was in that report? Uh, from the past ones, yeah. Yeah. But the problem, right, <laughs> the problem is putting a position on that is that you're depending on funding that's going to be fluctuating. And maybe to make up the difference in year to year, but yes, there could be some relief there. I mean, last year the funding was four million on six, but so maybe they'll increase the six. You know, I don't there. I I don't I don't see the politics to, to give rural schools that much money. But you know that kind of thing. We also I, I went to a meeting with the superintendents regarding the millionaires tax. Don't hold your breath on money. Right. That's I mean, going to go to education. higher ed more than K-12 It has education. to be divided between us and higher ed. It's going to be us and the bridges. It's going to be us yeah. and whatever. And um, it's going to go to higher need schools before it's going to go to ours. So don't be holding your breath on the, that, that money coming toward us. Maybe we'll get some trickle down and hopefully, hopefully we'll get some trickle down with that. But um, <clears throat> there will be some funds there to, you know, that could offset some other Things was in the budget um, from rural. I mean, I, I imagine we'll get the at least what we got last year. We went down this year compared to twenty two, though. Right. And we might Sunderland is might rated for, which is so strange because at one point Sunderland was the only one getting rural aid, but now that they've changed the criteria, Sunderland isn't even the highest tier. Conway, Deerfield, and Frontier. I think Waitley's in the highest tier also. I think Sunderland's down a tier. So we okay. lost $3,000 on our rural aid disbursement this year okay. compared to last year. So, you know, like Darius is saying, there's some, again, some risk. I feel like I'm repeating myself. Um, 12,500. Hmm. So, so, you know, so we see 50,000. Right, I mean, if they proportionally, if they double it, which means <laughs> they put it to 8 million, will it double? In the same measurement, but that would only give us twenty thousand dollars. Let's round up twenty-five thousand yeah. dollars. You know, not enough to cover the position. Yeah, will be helpful. What sort of challenge do you think you guys have been end up working on in terms of putting the whole package together for the town? I mean, you guys are 70 percent of the budget. There's not much we can do until we know where the schools come in. Right, but you also don't know cherry sheet numbers until the beginning of March. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm, we're putting the expenses in now. Um, but yeah, we're not, you know, March 1st when the governor releases her budget, we'll uh, or shortly thereafter, we'll at least have an idea. <laughs> and the town's finance in general, how you got a free cash number? Um, I was working with them last night. They, they had some questions about some CPA accounts that we were able to wrap up. They said that last thing, they need to run the reports. The reports look good. Then we can submit free cash. Okay. They 
keep Amazon in today. So. Okay. I just keep asking that's all. You're not the only one. We do. I do too. <laughs> okay. We all ask last night. I mean, for, for, for big picture context, um, I think it's almost a quarter on the conclusion that in, in some respect or another, we're going to be going to the town and asking for some kind of override, whether it's a debt exclusion or whether it's a capital override for capital projects or whether it's an override for the overall budget. There's, there's going to be an ask. I don't think we're ever going to get out this year without $200,000 is not going to cover everything that's been happening this year. It's just not. So it's going to be an override. Um, what I think what form that takes, whether we are able to fund the school as you asked and we will ask for money for something else, or whether it's tied in, that's all stuff that we're going to have to negotiate and talk about over the next few months. Um, and I think a big part of what this ask is going to come down to is whether or not we can convince the town, not necessarily for this, but whether we can convince the town of what we're asking for. And if we can get the overall pass, if we can get what we're asking for, we'd be in a position to probably be able to make these make this work. Um, if the town comes back and says no to everything, I mean, ju just the, the the bottom line, just the the, the you know, contract and staff increases is basically the school's portion of what we have to work with if we don't get more money. Mm -hmm. And so that's just hard, <laughs> especially because yeah. you can just be able to tell the maintenance department, sorry, no money for you is going to be a real hard thing. Um, but Unfortunately, if, 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 it, if it came down to us saying yes to more money for the town, if Prop 2 and a half didn't exist, a conversation would be happening right now. Um, but the big concern we have all around is everybody's out there paying eight dollars and a dozen for eggs, and everybody's complaining about money. Nobody's seeing 10% increases in the pay, and people in town would have had. It's going to be an uphill battle. It's, it, it's every time. Every time we ask for over, it's an uphill battle. Um, and, and most of the people here have knocked doors for one before um, and, and know that. But, you know, and, and one of the big questions we've been going back and forth is how big do we make the asks? Mm -hmm. If we ask for what we actually need and end up having that be a, 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 a no, no way to get past because we're asking for a million dollars from a town that can't afford it, um, do we ask for not enough and still maybe get shot down or? <laughs> this was not a great budget season for me to start in this before. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, the other side of it is that one of the things I want to serve on the board is because I understand how hard it is to fund the town big hours. And, you know, I had this like optimistic dream that I would come in, I would find fat in the budget, I could cut, and I'd find things. And what I'm finding is that the fat was cut 20 years ago. And then the muscle was cut five years ago. And, Photographs happened last year. <laughs> we're in a position where, you know, if a pandemic hadn't happened, we might be in a position where we want to. Um, but we were, our, our, our town's budget has been so tight for so long that it wasn't capable of withstanding the pressure of something like a pandemic without finding ourselves in a position where we're the dollar short where we need to be for this year ish. On the evening, go <laughs> so that's the Feel free to email your state representatives and yeah. state senators because everyone, uh, anyone who can make put pressure on them will definitely help. Um, so, you know, just context wise, I would love to give you everything you're asking for. I would try my absolute best to make everything that you're asking for happen. Um, but I would be naive to say, hey, is going to necessarily happen that way, you know, a, a lot of creative financing and a lot of work from you guys and us and the accountants and all that. So, yeah. That, that's actually really helpful to at least have that as a context and understand um, that, you, that we're probably going in with some kind of ask because then it becomes a question of managing it and, and like you said, balancing um, the twin regrets of, of having asked for too much and not getting it or having asked for too little and getting it. Uh, yeah. And there's always the, if it does fail, you ask yourself, oh, if only we'd ask for 50,000 less, it yeah. may have asked. And you don't know that. You could have asked for nothing. <laughs> so, I mean, 
mean, I, I, I think the good news is nothing we're going to ask for from you guys, from other departments, from capital projects is we're not asking for, hey, we want to like, you know, to do some beautification downtown or something like that that's going to be nice, but not necessary. We're talking about like an ambulance and, you know, keep to this elementary school and projects that are, are I would hope that, that, that adult people in town will look at and say, okay, yeah, we can't go with that. And I, I have I have a strong feeling that, that when it comes to town meeting, we will likely get the yes. I'm mostly worried about when we go to town in general, you know, about it. You know, regular person who had paid zero attention to the whole process goes in, they don't read the whole thing, they look at it, they look at the thing, they see how much the cost them in their in their taxes, and they go, hey, no, we don't know on that. So um wasn't it be real I heard it said months or something. Anytime you ask for two and a half percent override, you're going to override. We're going to get an automatic three hundred people that vote no. You yeah. can go on expecting that. So you have to find three hundred people who vote yes. In order to make that work. Um, and so I, mean, I guess you guys are sitting there thinking, what can we do to make this better? We are likely going to have some door knocking issues that we're going to have to kick off this spring um, in order to get around to apartment complexes, get around to the go to soccer games and, and talk to all the families that are there being like, hey, you like these fields, you like having your kids at the services, well, show up to the bookies. Um, because you're right, we, we if we do nothing, we have hundred people who vote yes and three people who vote yes. Yeah. <clears throat> so we're ready to So looking at the timeline, as you guys have an early <laughs> town meeting, right? So, we have to have a public hearing on the budget. Um, right now, it's scheduled in our calendar for March 14th. It's a month and a week away. Um, I imagine you guys are going to, you're saying you need our school budgets. Um, let me take one step back to the information thing. We expect the governor's budget by March 1st. Or during that week of March 1st, right? Frontier will also know its assessments in the week of March 1st and is expecting to have two meetings the following week on March 7th and 8th. Um, I'm just kind of saying all this so then we'll, you'll have the information, we'll have all the information for what the costs of the schools are going into the public hearing on the 14th, but we won't have a meeting prior to the public hearing. We're going to need to put another meeting on the books because we won't have doesn't sound like we're making any decisions tonight for a budget to be moving forward to the public hearing and that I mean, our next conversation is going to be like what do, you know, what is the administration charge to do next but also while you're here I just want to kind of say what the timeline is out loud because I imagine you need our budget we were saying since we're saying we're saying your budget you need our budget pretty darn early or at least an estimate so that you can plan off that yeah it kind of helps right um I mean, I could put a zero in it. It'd be really helpful. We could. That would definitely make our. We've done that before, FYI. Let's <laughs> <laughs> not. We have a um, meeting date yet. Uh, the last Friday of the 28th. <clears throat> so, fair. We either need to schedule another school committee meeting or we need to commit to hammering this out super quick because we got a lot of other items on the agenda and thanks everyone for hanging out well, so the, rest of the so agenda far. is pretty slim outside of this to be honest with you um yeah. so don't feel i mean probably could do it in 10 minutes of raising a lot of questions but the um but you really we can't do the budget tonight you're gonna you know i think you're sounds gonna well, ask us possible to elimination Right, and, and that the, the date on the fourteenth isn't set in stone. It's just what we pre count. You know, I mean, I haven't. Um, one of the things on my agenda for this evening is to set up when the public hearing is because I got to get that in. Yeah, yeah. I need two weeks in advance, plus a few days for proofing of the newspaper article. So, yeah. um, so you know, we could do a. I'm trying to figure. It's the dates are getting full in March, yeah, yeah. but the you know we could do a date. In March and not have the public hearing until something like the 28th. Um, 
but once you have your budget earlier, usually it doesn't wiggle much. Um, you know what I mean? For the public, in a public hearing sense, I mean, the public hearing sense is really, <coughs> through my experience, 99% of it is talking with the town boards, is the public hearings. That those are the folks that are going to have input, you know, feedback that's, that is, you know, moves that needle um, tremendously. Um, not saying a public person couldn't, but I'm just saying historically, it's all about the town government. Um, so I don't know. Um, my, my calendar is wide open. Uh, at the very least I can do asking uh, more from you people in your evenings, et cetera, is, is be flexible in, in uh, schedule. Peter? It just seems to me that if we could pick, suppose we had a, suppose we had another meeting in the last day of February. Yep. We wouldn't know anything more. That's true. So it's not clear to me that we would have a whole lot to do that was anything different than what we're doing right now. Um, we have been in this situation in past years where we have gone to the select board, not for the public hearing, but for a select board hearing, okay, which has been so common, but um, there's sort of a problem with that because you're sort of a little bit late in the process. And I think, you know, for example, this meeting tonight is much more useful than coming to you when we sort of really already got, you know, the, the number set for, you know, what's going to be the public hearing and we have to do the, you know, we get a <coughs> practice time doing the song and dance with your board. And then we have a public hearing that basically nobody's at and it's all sort of seems sort of not the best way to do business. Um, I think tonight has been very useful. I think, you know, I mean, I, with me, I'd say, here's your number right now. Okay. Put it in the spreadsheet. Okay. That'll show you how big the, you know, how big that part of the problem is. Okay. We should go ahead and have our meeting, have our hearing on the 14th, which isn't that much time for you to go ahead and start the process of scheduling it. We couldn't have it much earlier. I don't see any reason to have the public hearing later because we got to have a public hearing, but we can still make changes after the public hearing. Correct? Correct. So it's not like we have the public I hearing and whatever we present. Yeah, that's a law or that's just best practice. Yeah, the question is, is it the law or is the practice? Things happen. I mean, things happen. We come, I mean, suppose we have the public hearing, then yeah, okay. But then the word comes back from the select board, you know, we we can't afford this until you cut, you know, 50 grand off the budget. I think you can reduce <laughs> the budget if you're not sure you can increase it. Right. And I think we'd be in a position that we would, be, that would be okay. Because we would be, you know, if we start at the position where we are right now. We wouldn't be looking to go up. I don't think anybody's looking to go up. Yeah. <laughs> right? right. You know, and the question is, you know whether and to how much we might have to go in the other direction but we could still go ahead and have the public hearing mm -hmm. okay uh and then the question is do we you know what do we do as far as our normal presentation to the select board okay which you have it, you know where we are right now which is what we've gotten okay we've had actually a good discussion um and so i would say on that you know, it's almost like we need to have a little flexibility and say, we're going to keep in touch and we're probably going to be sitting down and talking through the same sort of stuff when we've got more pieces of the puzzle and seeing, you know, how bad the situation is or what sort of strategy we might have in terms of what we want to present to the town, what sort of numbers we want to use there. But, um, you know, and whether we want to have that meeting, <coughs> let's say, you know, the town offices next time instead of here um if you wish or we could do it the same night we have the public hearing and if we could get you know maybe maybe i mean this to me is like great sitting here with, you know we got two out of three of you and we got jeff here and so on and that's uh it's really useful and and maybe just we have the public hearing and you know we could have it right here the same situation and have a good discussion with you all as part of that hearing and okay what are we really going to do 
and then we vote our budget, and then maybe we voted exactly what we got here, or maybe at that point, you all have done some you know, number crunching and come up with a, you know some alternatives, and who knows? But uh, um, you know, so that's sort of what I think would make more. So I don't see any. I don't see what we're going to accomplish. We have a meeting in late February. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I hear what you're saying with regards to the more information <laughs> that's arriving in the first week of March. Yeah, but even that, it's. I, mean, I think we just ought to schedule, you know, do the public hearing. If we got a schedule and actually combine it right at that moment, or get together with the select board. So you're not, you're not also coming over to sit in the select board meeting to give the same song and dance. Now, you know, we've all been through and so on. And it just, that to me, it's a, it's a more reasonable way of doing it. So you're saying have the public hearing and then have a separate meeting to vote the budget? No, have the public meeting, have the public hearing. Do it in a way so whether we do it here or at town hall okay with the select board you know present okay and whatever discussion we want to have after that or prior to it whatever about you know we may have discussions actually leading up to it that say okay we're gonna you know talk about a lower i don't know what okay that's still you know there's a lot here that really worked out but i think that we're not we're not we're not having a couple of meetings to you know with the same cast of characters and just Replaying the tape in the second one. Uh, do you need the, uh, the But I don't like, I mean, you guys, you don't know where we're going to end up. You know, and you're not saying, you're not able to say at this point, gee, if you take that position off of there and you cut 20000 off of the extra money for expenses, <laughs> then that number will fly because you've got no idea what the big, how the big picture is going to turn out. Okay. But um, I still think this is a useful meeting. Oh, yeah. And, and, very and uh, but I don't, I don't see a need to go through two times like it's been the, practice of you know basically present the budget so on and then we sit down and we vote it without having made a single change because of all that stuff and it's sort of like well why do we do you know you've said that before you know why do we do this so I'm yeah just, i'm just sort of missing the piece where we vote on the budget we don't have we to vote, vote the night of we, the public we meeting. don't have to but we certainly can <laughs> and maybe it become obvious yeah this is what we want to vote and maybe well we've got to schedule another meeting in the next week to you know because really there got to be some serious things we got to talk about don't know. Don't know. Part of that depends on, you know, a large part of it depends on what sort of numbers the town's ending up with and, and what, you know, these guys' opinion is as to what sort of overall budget we want to present to the town. We don't know right now. And some of that, you know, that's, we're part of a group here. We're not, I mean, we're not just sort of, okay, we're going to present our budget. There it is. And you deal with whatever. No, because we got to have a way of figuring this out for the whole town with all of us who work, you know, trying to do stuff for the town and, 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 and so on, working together. So. so it sounds like procedurally we could vote the budget on the 14th at the public hearing. Is that what I'm hearing? Typically, that is what we do. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but you, you have it you, that during the public hearing, you voted at the meeting following. We open, if, we open a public hearing, we close a public hearing, and then we have the regular business right. of the school. Right, but just but because, of, because of the timing with things like, you know, the way the cherry sheets are coming out and so yeah. on, you know, it's imagine if we were last year and we said, okay, we're going to have the public hearing and, and vote on the budget in the mid, middle of February. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's not sort of, you know, we're, we're, or even beginning of February. And it's like, you know, I, I can very much see we have the public hearing. And then we have a bunch of discussion and then well maybe we're ready to vote maybe it's like okay we got to go you know we, we got, may or may we got not plan be. b plan b really needs to be worked out and let's have a meeting next week same time and then we'll vote on it w worst case we have to have a separate <laughs> meeting afterwards after but i think it's much more useful to have one after the public hearing yeah. get the public hearing done yeah. then you're not so constrained because anytime you mess with the public <laughs> hearing you got the two and a half weeks notice stuff and we'll have more information yeah so that's just, I'm just tossing this out. And Derek, you know, if you're. <coughs> that, that works, that, that's that, fine, but that's is fine that by me. Or that was, for you? That's mm -hmm. fine by me. I was, uh, the suggestion I was having was just, was to move it later to have more time with the accurate numbers of Frontier will have its budget by the 8th of March, because mm -hmm. it has to have it by, by law by the 11th of March. And so that's what they gave themselves two day buffer in case they have another meeting on the 10th. But um, so then we also know what the 
with the assessment is the town of frontier. So now we have all the we have all those numbers mm -hmm. that they are going to need um, to talk about. You know, the school's percentage. At the same time, they're going to get the cherry sheets. At the same time, they're going to be working the cherry sheets when Frontiers work in their budget that week. And so, you know, the fourteenth is fine if people want to go in with a with a higher. Not that I'm saying higher, but the was relatively a high budget number at the public hearing, and as long as we everybody's on the same page with that, it, it's I mean, you guys, totally I think that's the reason we And I just, you know, I I just want to do it so that <laughs> when you all are in on a meeting, you all as participants, not just sitting there being told, you know, here it is, go through the whole thing again, so on. Because you get that's that's way more useful. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm all about coming and listening to you guys talk and so just rehash what we talked about tonight one more time before the public hearings. Yeah. Let's yeah. do the public hearing and then have more information. Um, there is, I would assume that the tech school will have their numbers to us around the 8th also. Would that be a good assumption? I mean, I know that's not your... So I have, no, I have no idea when they usually send you the numbers. Okay. Um, they must have the same, I would assume they have the same rule that they give anybody with 45 days out for your town meeting, which they probably have it. They're probably even before us because they're giving more towns. And so whoever has the first town meeting, is, is Deerfield really the first town meeting in all of Franklin County? It's possible. It is early, but um, so I get, I bet you you'll have those numbers at the same time. Um, I can send Rick a note and let you know. Rick Martin, the superintendent of Franklin Tech. Yeah, man, I don't see it making sense to try to nail you know, down the budget until we have, at the very least, the numbers from Frontier and from Tech School. Because I mean, those could be wildly different than we think they're going to be, and that changes the conversation a bunch one way there. So I, yeah, I'm, I'm with Peter on the on the 14th being <coughs> public hearing. Who or if we can vote on it, great. If not, then you know, out. But, you know, All right. Any more on the budget? Or yeah, Jeff, just, go ahead. Shelly, the three point three million dollars that includes transportation, right? Yes. Um, and then this is just me, so I'll throw it out there. I like thinking about hard questions that I might have to answer. So I'll, I'll let you know what my hard question would be, which is enrollment's been going down for five years and cost of being going up. And I know every the cost of everything is going up. There's an answer for it, but it's just looking at this that was my initial reaction. So, yeah, I, I'm just so that you could, I, and I know that there's an answer for it, but I'd rather <laughs> I'd rather you be prepared than surprised if it happens this last board meeting or here <laughs> or town meeting. So the hard question too is that what I, but I'm seeing this is really coming down to is the adjustment council position. As eliminating the adjustment counselor, the prospective adjustment counselor position would drop uh, our increase to in the area of 4%, which I think is completely reasonable, historically a reasonable ask. I, I look at it with the, not necessarily the drop in attendance, but it's the class sizes. And I think smaller class sizes provide better opportunity to address student needs immediately rather than having, I think the larger class sizes you have, Immediately, immediately means you have to have those adjustment counselor positions. So when we talk about adding the adjustment counselor and then combining classes to get 19 or 20, I'm like, well, that's the reason why you have to have adjustment counselors. If you can get classes to 10, you can deal with it right away. So that's what, that's where I'm stuck at. And, and and for me, if I like, if I got to eliminate and those combining classes, those are eliminating people's jobs. That's that's the real thing. And, and for me, I would rather eliminate the, the job of the, the, the that somebody doesn't have yet then to eliminate the position that somebody actually has well and, and you make a good point but i would also like to bring this to the town because there's no doubt that student needs are higher than ever before and i see it all the time and it's, it's up to the town you know yeah we can eliminate this position that's meeting the needs of your children do you want to pay for it and the, the two and a half percent i can't stand because it's a completely arbitrary number. It gutted education when I was in school. I, I mean, I remember when I went through. And there's been this concept now that <clears throat> two and a half percent is 
proper budget. That if you go above two and a half percent, you've done something wrong, and that's just, it's it's totally false. You said I don't know who's getting a ten percent thing of the increase in the pay. Somebody is. It's not really anybody around here, but costs are skyrocketing everywhere. <coughs> but we can't we can't just raise it as well. That two and a half percent is about transparency. It's it's actually letting the town know what it actually costs to fund the entire town. It's not that something has that has happened wrong. It's that this is actually what it costs. But I also feel that in the past, anytime that there's been a two and a half override, the message has been because of the school. And I don't I hope that would not be the message because I think we've been trying to, like you said, pro provide lean budgets over the years. It's everybody's coming in asking for more. It's it's the it's about the town, not just the school. Well, so then the whole point of there is I mean, the only reason we would want to have the school be not front and center, but but in, in part of the cabal that we're coming and asking for is because the school brings support that other departments do. And, and it is the biggest to ask for yeah. support for the DPW when this road looked great in town, potholes are down, and you know, culprits look good. That's a real hard ask to come and say that we need more money for the town because we need a new dump truck, but you need a new dump truck. Um, it's easier to get support through the school because <coughs> there are more people in town that have a invest interest in the school than any other particular department in town. Not to say that they need to like throw the school under the bus every time you do an override because it's the convenient choice, but just that is part of the consideration is, you know, <coughs> I'd like to have it be a little bit of everybody, you know, school, police, fire, you know, we have people in town who are, are, are big, you know, proponents of the police department, great. We'll, 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 you know, we'll uh, look to them for support there also. Um, and, and back to what you said earlier about the, the position, um, you know, the position is not just about the students, it's also about supporting the teachers. It's also about making the teachers more comfortable in their jobs. And you improve the quality of the teachers' lives, you improve the quality of the, the education they're allowed, they're able to survive. Um, and I do think if it came down to, do we cut a position for a classroom teacher, and add this position or not, I don't know that we're re making the teachers' lives any easier or better by making larger class sizes in order to provide this position. And, and again, I, I love them both, but at the end of the day, um, I mean, it'd be lovely if these numbers were 16 kids in all the classes, and then there was that one class that just, you know, you know that there's one, you know, one of these grades that we could actually split up and not have the, it's, it's just because it's so across the board, it's hard to look at that and say, there isn't any good year. Um, that's one of the reasons why I brought up the idea of maybe doing like a, a third, fourth, three classrooms between third and fourth, because then you end up getting, we did that in, in Chiefsburg when I was growing up, there was a, you know, um, because the way the numbers worked, you, you, you couldn't find any other way to do it. Is it ideal? No. Um, and so I, I think I'm kind of with you on the, if it came down to either having to cut somebody who's already part of the Sunny Milton family, who has a job, who, you know, Whose coworkers will miss them versus adding a position. That would be a hard separate. Hopefully, we don't have to make that decision. Hopefully, we're able to find a way to do both. But that may not be in the cards. So, okay. and, and just to address uh, something, uh, Jeff's question a little bit too. Um, I think everyone has been really responsible in talking very conservatively about choice and when and if it will rebound um we don't know, you know we know that that when we've had choice in the past it's helped to offset some costs um we know when we had a crisis where uh the schools had to cut a lot of supports that we had flight in the opposite direction and it took a long time to bring people back so in some ways uh make having class sizes that are relatively small in a supportive environment is a way of at least uh, opening the door to the possibility of future uh, choice in down the road, even if it's not, you know, this year. Do you think we're about set on this then? I think so. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Review and approve the minutes. You guys can stick around, buddy. Yeah, you guys want to close your meeting?
Uh, entertain a motion for adjourning. I move the adjournment. <laughs> I'll second myself. If you want to do <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for having us. I appreciate it a lot. Happy to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope Bowser do not keep this there. Some of the rules would like to be the I'm glad I didn't see the door seal there. We, we did get a G in our flag. You did. We did. <laughs> None of the other towns got a bunch of D. So if you could just change it to the flag. Yeah. Right on it. Get my uh, graphic designer right on it. You the teacher that did cartoons. Thank you. Thank you. Comics are not cartoons. Good night. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Good night. Thank you. Thanks. Motion to approve the minutes. Yeah. Second. Second. All right. All in favor? Yes. All right. Five all. Let's see. Financial statements signed once. So I emailed you the expense reports. There's no uh, new major expenses to discuss since we last met. That's sort of the theme right now where everything is status quo, which is great. Um, we signed, or you signed, 20 warrants electronically, totaling $122,819.65. Um, I'm happy to take questions about these. Have, have any? Um, otherwise, you know, 23 budget is on par as planned. Nothing new there. I think the only thing that, you know, I think we talked about this last time maybe where Ben and Bill have been working on a deferred maintenance list. So, you know, we're in conversation on how to start to tackle those pieces with it. Nothing major. Any others? <coughs> On to the principal's report. Great. Uh, so I'll lighten the mood a little bit with loaves of love. Uh, the King Arthur Baking Company um, swung by Sunderland Elementary School in um, mid-January. They had an outreach program for students in grades 4 through 12, where they teach the students in a, um, a hands-on live assembly to make dough from scratch. And so each uh, student left uh, in grades 4 through 6 with a goodie bag of um, couple bags of uh, dough, some yeast, and directions on how to make bread. And uh, students were asked to keep one loaf for them and their families, and then return another loaf to SES. And we, in total, donated 42 to the uh, Salvation Army Greenfield. And that uh, event was organized by our school counselor, Vicki Palmer. And then um, in late January, um, the PTO sponsored the Snowflake Dance, and it um, uh, featured a live DJ, and uh, we saw roughly over, actually between 100 and 120 students, and that uh, event was really spirited by one of our talented instructional assistants, Shelly Chow. So uh, kudos to her for that. Report. Outstanding. Yeah. Can I just go back to the financial thing? Just one, uh, I know Jeff, when he puts together the whole town budget stuff, it's, the school budget is two line items. It's everything but transportation and then transportation. So I don't know if it's clear on this what the transportation number is. But if you could send him, you know. Yeah, when I do, when I give him our final numbers, I break it out for them. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you had, if you knew it now, I just say send it to them because that goes, you know, keep them happy in the spreadsheet. But if you don't have it, you don't have it. Okay. I can pull it out. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think my daughter helped with a little security for the snowflake pants. <laughs> she she did a good job. Um, I did not attend. I had a prior commitment, but um, some students from the National Honor Society <clears throat> over at Frontier did. Um, Serve as bouncers, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and let the cha-cha slide. Yeah. 
Outstanding. All right. I didn't hear any public comment. Anyone got hands up online? All right. In that case, unfinished business, Commonwealth of MA virtual <clears throat> school enrollment restrictions. Vote. Right. <clears throat> so we tabled this last time um, in an effort to get more information. Um, I don't have more information. And so I kind of dropped the ball on that in the sense I didn't know what I was supposed to get when I was reviewing this today. And so it said get more information. I didn't know what I was supposed to get. It was and, whether we'd be responsible for a special education differential. That's yeah. um, so I don't have that answer. It's my fault. No, <laughs> it's my fault. Um, Can we find that out if we table for another month? Or I guess next month. No, I think hold. we have to vote on this by and we have to vote on this by March 1st. Yeah. I believe that was the date. Just interrupted the budget cycle. I'm not sure. Yes. Yeah. We did talk about that because it shows up as part of the school choice claim and yeah. has an option of whether or not they're special education students. My, my, rec <laughs> my recollection is that we have <laughs> currently two students mm -hmm. that converts to 1.14 percent oh uh, we therefore could not vote anything that would you know cause either them not to be able to attend and you can't remove attend. anybody that's what i mean you can't remove anybody uh <clears throat> there was uh um discussion part of the discussion was as to whether uh putting the limit at two percent which would allow a total of three students at any one time was a reasonable place to put it um and i don't know if that's something that we would be willing to vote for at this point or not maybe you know i don't i don't know that was sort of my intention but i don't know what other things i think it's reasonable to vote in a limit um my concern is that um this is this is we have families with medical disabilities for whom the pandemic is an ongoing, serious, grave concern. And that having a publicly funded, fully remote option could become the best thing for a family in order to have all of their family members stay safe. So I would like us to set a cap that is high enough that one more family, you know, if, if their medical circumstances change because any family could become medically, have a member become medically disabled. Um, I'd like us to set it high enough that a family, so more than one child, probably could actually attend without getting cut off from that access, from that resource. So like a number of four in attendance and whatever that percentage is? What do you think of families? Yeah, is? You know, four so people two attending. More, right? yeah. Yeah. I mean, just, we could do a... We have to do a whole number? Well, we could do whatever the... We could... I think it's a to make case. sure, you know, the, if the thought is they want to be able to make four students attend, we can make it to the percentages so that it's, you know, rounded up. I think we have the thing where if we made it 3%, then that would allow up to five students. Five, yeah. Is it? And whether we were willing to go with that. I mean, there is a... We could do it to a two and a half percent. We, we've got our enrollment numbers. We can calculate this. Right. That's what I'm saying. If you tell me what the number is, we can do, we can, we can convert that to the percentage based on... <clears throat> What's that? Okay, so, so I'll make that. a motion that we approve a limit, um, <coughs> a, a limit of four students with the administration to figure out what percentage uh, would be required to be submitted so that that would be. Right. And if it has to be a round number, then we'll round up. Right. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor? All right. Opposed? Unanimous. All right. I would make it. I already forgot. They don't get old. Yeah. <laughs> a cap of a total of four students. A total of four students. Okay. That's what I thought. But I just I made it. New business. School choice participation vote. So um, my my understanding is that the school committee votes to either say yes, we are a school choice school. Um, or no, not to accept school choice, right? As opposed to the number of students per, per grade level. They can cap students in grade level. 
that was a modification from my year. Was a modification. from my okay. first year when we were talking about that that they said that they can but go on please okay so um <clears throat> so in the sheet we shared with the school committee we're um, recommending greater than one student um for each grade level and um that allows even if we do not have any applications if an in-town current resident um moves out but the family still wants to have that student continue at ses that's not like it's creating a new space um so each each opening for k through six is greater than one at this time as of today we have four applications two in kindergarten um <coughs> one in second grade and one in sixth grade for next year so a motion would seem to be needed that just said that we approve the school's participation in school choice for the 2023-24 school year. <laughs> Any further discussion? All, right, all in favor? All right, all right. All opposed. Can I bring up a piece of new business that doesn't require a vote? Sure. So I was asked to bring this up to Principal Ben um, that the Sunderland Fire Department is celebrating their 90th birthday this year. And there will be, they are having a some sort of birthday party on April 29th at the Public Safety Complex. And it's going to be opened up. There's going to be chili cook off, fire, bonfire. They're going to have a whole fest event. <laughs> They bought a new truck about a year and a half ago, and they want to name the truck, and there's going to be a vote for naming the truck. I'm on it. Thank you. The elementary school. <laughs> After you. Okay. They would like the elementary school kids to come up with the possible names that to vote on. Mm -hmm. What they're asking nice. is each grade PK, pre-K through six to choose a name, to submit a name, and then I, I don't know whether it's the library here or the library in town to take submissions from children who are not, children in town are not attending SES. Okay. So that they would come up with a possible eight submissions and then at the celebration, they would have a vote there and then that's what the truck would be named. So they, didn't, they didn't want it to be a burden on the teachers, but they wanted it. Um, be Sounds like fun. The kids would be happy yeah. to be involved. Yeah. I think yeah. schools can be able to submit one. <laughs> <laughs> what do we got early on? <laughs> I'm happy that it's so happy. <laughs> <laughs> what year birthday was it? 90th birthday of the Sun One Fire Department. You name it after Mr. B. Every time the truck goes by, it's Mr. B. <laughs> I don't know what to say. So I have to be modern again. I still see the bread people like pulling out, and it's like a fog of flower coming out the back as they drive away. The King Arthur people. It's not like that, is it? That was the no. image you had. That was the when image like this truck it? pulls up and there's like all this <laughs> white flower coming out of the driveway and some big smoke people. Yeah, make for a messy bus ride. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Keep that real. Bring that real. Any uh committees? Not Oh, the town capital committee meets every couple of weeks now and we're just progressing through the normal stuff and the school stuff is on there and you know it was great we had, was had a discussion about the oil tank here mm -hmm. and it feels like it was that needed to get it moving and so that was excellent um again we got the you know we got we we got good relations with the select board and that, you know, not the case where that really helps and what you know you were working with Jeff and Ben for getting the whole playground done and or you know something like that is really awesome for having these things end up properly done so thank you all right <coughs> superintendent report yeah just some quick updates the equity audit that's coming the 20th to the 22nd um, Jen will be sending out a sign up if folks want to be part of the interviews if you also should put this in the note, but if you can't make this, it's, it's during the day um, on Monday or Tuesday. 
if you can't make one of those, you could also go to the evening um, parent one and just be you know, going at the general with the parents and just be a super, uh, yeah, a school team member being interviewed then. So that that sign up's coming out probably tomorrow. I got it today. You got it today, so she's already on it. Good for her. She's quicker than I imagined. Um, so that's good. Um, the other thing is the um, the superintendency agreement committee. Um, I right now have submitted that to the attorney. The attorney was kind of looking it over and he wants to talk with the state about it because the state has to approve any um, any union contract uh, unionizations and contracts. Um, and the fact that we didn't fix the union 38 problem with that, we've created a procedure on how to govern the superintendent kind of deal, how to hire, fire, and discipline, um, and so forth, and how the process would work with the five groups or five schools. Um, we have no real clear language, we just have historic. Um, so we kind of went that route. And when I handed it to him, he said, well, you still don't have a union agreement to fall back on. And I'm not sure the state's going to support this. So he actually has set up a meeting with the state um, and several of those people to discuss our situation and what we should be doing. So I don't know if it's going to make us take a step back um, and I'm worried about that. The process that we came up with was pretty good. At least there was a process there. Um, so anyway. We formed a union without having a union agreement? No, there's a union agreement, um, but nobody can find it. Oh, okay. <clears throat> In the state doesn't collect them, apparently. They collect <laughs> regional agreements, but not union agreements, because the union agreements you know, were way back when they were, you know. And there's... How many of them? Not very many. Not many. <laughs> so, uh, well, there's a lot of them have dissolved and become region agreements, yeah. you know. Um, so, and this is, so if we go back and do a union agreement to make it even more complicated, he, he was like, he was looking at it and he said, well, Frontier shouldn't have a vote as part of your agreement because you have a union agreement in front. And so it got very complicated very quickly where I was like, oh boy. If this goes back, it's going to be one of those politically, very heavy politically driven things of where the power lies. Um, so he said, let me go talk to the state, see what they recommend we do. Um, try and, and do something good. Try to do something good and only causing more problems. And then that goes right back to what Phil said. Right? <laughs> 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 I don't want to agree with him. <laughs> hey, don't feel so much this meeting. But, um, I didn't want to agree with him on that. So, yeah, so the mess continues, but. Um, We'll see what happens. The document that we did come up with um, that we were getting ready to present um, did kind of have steps on like, you know, if I was to to leave and, and somebody else was take over and there was disagreements between towns about who the next superintendent would be, it kind of spells out the process of how to do that, um, which I thought was really important to have. So uh, hopefully we'll see where that goes. And there'll probably <laughs> still be a lot of discussion on those decisions there. In While I was in that meeting, <laughs> Um, Ken and Bob were in that, and they both said, can we move the super, superintendent evaluation up? Right now, we've been had the chair of the school of Frontier and the chair of 38, um, which probably had to be reignited at, uh, the 38 probably should be reboted at the spring joint meeting. But can we move that up so that we get your, your evaluation done at, for the joint meeting? So I'm in the process of putting together the evaluation template that we've used in the past to send that out. You don't need to do one this year. After your first three years, we can go to every other year. That would be great. I think that'd be best. I've already put in several hours into this thing, but <laughs> save you from putting in more this year. We don't have to do oh. it. Um. Wow. I, I can look into that. Um, I've attended several MAS, MASC right. webs uh, seminars on this. Yeah. And I'm quite confident after the first three years, you can go to every other year, just like the teachers can. Just like the teachers. Wow. And I guess I have been three now that this is, yeah. Okay. Well, all right. I don't know what to do with that. Call up the two chairs and if they agree, just. So, okay, I'll call it. up the two chairs and see if they agree. Right. And just do um, it. Don't, you know, yeah. have a vote on it. I think just do it. Yeah. Or maybe you can change it to getting some of just getting feedback. That would be helpful too. And then um, our anti racism equity committee is tomorrow, the third meeting. Um, I was involved with that. And, um, 
I can give you an update from that when that's being done. This is kind of weird because you guys are the first meeting. All the other school three meetings this month fall after that. Um, and then there's another meeting of uh, the equity committee on the 27th. Um, and I'll be giving them an update <coughs> and the audit and such um, in their role. So that's just my quick superintendent's report. But okay. Outstanding. All right. Uh, in that case, you're done, Bob? Yeah, yeah. Motion to adjourn. Go for it. I think it's turn. Do it. Motion to adjourn? Yeah. <laughs> I'll make a motion to adjourn. Awesome. Second. All in favor? Thank you all. <laughs>